good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Let's see what's going on here. Hey, Nicole, how are you? How you doing? Provided that you're you're there. Hey, uh, so audio balance test. Everything sounding okay. Good. Awesome. All right. I think we're just going to jump into it. <coughs> and pull this up here. Pull this up here. Okay. So, welcome once again to another story time with Kurt. Previously, in Chapter 3, uh, Tom had won the auction and met up with Eradicate Jones. And there was a log across the, the road that Eradicate was trying to get past. And Tom figured out that it was put there. Not. Accidentally. So, we'll pick up with Chapter 4 called Tom and Andy Clash. Even a casual observer could have told that an auto had some part in dragging the log to the place where it had blockaded the road. In the dust were many marks of the big rubber tires and even the imprint of a rope which had been used to tow the tree trunk. Why do you think someone put that log there? asked Eradicate as he followed Tom. Boomerang, the mule, so-called because Eradicate said you could never tell what he was going to do, opened his eyes lazily and closed them again. I don't know why, Rad, unless they wanted to wreck with an automobile or wagon. Maybe Tramps did it for spite. Maybe someone's done it to make you have some trouble there, Mr. Swift. No, I hardly think so. I don't know of anyone who would want to make trouble for me, and how would they know I was coming this way? Tom suddenly checked himself. The memory of the scene at the auction came back to him, and he recalled what Andy Foger had said about getting even. Which way did that automobile go? Resumed Eradicate. It came from down the road, answered Tom, not completing the sentence he had left unfinished. They dragged the log up to the foot of the hill and left it. Then the auto went down this way. It was comparatively easy for a lad of such sharp observation as with Tom to trace the movements of the vehicle. Then, if it's down here, maybe we can catch him, suggested Eradicate. The young inventor did not answer at once. He was hurrying along, his eyes on the telltale marks. He had proceeded some distance from the place where the log was when he uttered a cry. At the same moment, he hurried from the road towards a thick clump of bushes that were in the ditch alongside the highway. Reaching them, he parted the leaves and called, Here's the auto, Rad. The uh, Eradicate ran up, his eyes wider than ever, and there amid the bushes was a large touring car. Whose is that? asked Eradicate. Tom didn't answer. He penetrated the underbrush, noting that the broken branches had been upright after the force of the entrance of the car. Wow, that was so convoluted. I'm going to read that sentence all over again. <laughs> he penetrated the underbrush, noting where the, where the broken branches had been bent upright after the forced entrance of the car, the better to hide it. The young inventor was seeking some clue to discover the owner of the machine. To this end, he climbed up in the tunnel and was looking about when someone burst in through the screen of bushes and a voice cried, Here, get out of my car! Oh, is it your car, Andy Foger? asked Tom calmly. He recognized his squint-eyed rival. 
I was just beginning to think it was. Allow me to return your wrench. And he held out the one he had picked up near the log. The next time you drag trees across the road, went on the lad in the tunnel, facing the angry and dismayed Andy, I'd advise you to post a notice at the top of the hill so persons riding down will not be injured. Notice, road, hill, logs, <laughs> stammered Andy, turning red under his freckles. That's what I said, replied Tom coolly. I didn't have anything to do with the putting a log across that road, mumbled the bully. I've been off toward the creek. Have you? asked Tom with a peculiar smile. I thought you might have been looking for the wrench you dropped near the log. You should be more careful, and so should Sam Snedeker, who's hiding outside the bushes, went on our hero, for he had caught sight of the form of Andy's crony. I, I, I told him not to do it, exclaimed Sam as he came from his hiding place. Shut up, Andy. Or, <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's not what he said. He said, shut up. <laughs> that's all he said. Oh, I think I know your secret, continued the young inventor. You wanted to get even with me for outbidding you on the motorboat. You watched which road I took, and then in your auto you came a shorter way ahead of me. You hauled the log across the foot of the hill, hoping, I suppose, that my machine would be broken. But, let me tell you, it was a risky trick. Not only might I have been killed, but so would whoever else who happened to drive down the slope over the log, whether in a wagon or an automobile. Fortunately, Eradicate discovered it in time and warned me. I ought to have you arrested, but you're not worth it. A good thrashing is just what such sneaks as you deserve. You haven't got any evidence against us, sneered Andy confidently, his old bravado coming back. I have all I want, replied Tom. You needn't worry, I'm not going to tell the police, but you've got to do one thing or I'll make you sorry you ever tried this trick. Eradicate will help me, so don't think you're going to escape. You get out of my automobile, demanded Andy. I'll have you arrested if you don't. I'll get out because I'm ready to, not on account of your threats, retorted Mr. Swift's son. Here's your wrench. Now, I want you and Sam to start up this machine and haul that log out of the way. Suppose I won't do it, snapped Andy. Then I'll cause your arrest, besides thrashing you into the in, in, into the bargain. That's really weird. Then I'll cause your arrest, besides thrashing you into the bargain. I guess that's basically just him saying, I'll cause your arrest and thrash you as part of the bargain. You can take your choice of removing the log so travelers can pass or have a good hiding, you and Sam. Eradicate, you take Sam. I'll tackle Andy. Don't you dare touch me, cried the bully, but there was a whine in his tones. You let me alone, or I'll tell my father, added Sam. I, I, I didn't have anything to do with it anyhow. I told Andy it would make trouble, but he made me help him. Say, what's the matter with you? demanded Andy indignantly of his crony. Do you what? <sighs> I wish I'd never come with you, went on Sam, who was beginning to be frightened. Come on now, start up that engine and, and haul the log out of the way, demanded Tom again. I won't do it, retorted the red-haired lad impudently. Yes, you will, insisted our hero, and he took a step towards the bully. They were out of the clump of bushes now and in the roadside ditch. You let me alone! Almost screamed Andy, and in his baffled rage, he rushed at Tom, aiming a blow. The young inventor quickly stepped to one side, and as the bully passed him, Tom sent out a neat left-hander. Andy Foger went down in a heap on the grass. End of chapter four. Okay, so we're going back to the chat room. Uh, that might have been... One of the shortest chapters I've ever read on these. So weird. And Snorks, good to see you, man. Ugh. So, uh, hope everybody's been having a pretty good weekend. Thank you for joining me here in the, in the chat. Let's 
see. I have a feeling I've got some folks that have been uh, watching without actually logging in so we can't see them in the chat room. Which is cool. i got no issue with that. If you are, uh, welcome. Alright, so let's just get back to it. Maybe we'll end up doing four chapters tonight. I don't know. We'll see. I've been planning three chapters, but that was so short. All right, back to the story. Previously, in Chapter 4 of Tom Swift and His Motorboat, uh, basically, Tom found out that it was Andy Foger that caused the problem in the, in the log in the road, and uh, a fight appeared to be about to ensue. Chapter 5, A Test of Speed. Whether Tom or Andy was the most surprised at the happening would be hard to say. The former had not meant to hit so hard, and he certainly did not intend to knock the squint-eyed youth down. The latter's fall was due, as much as anything, to his senseless rushing tactics and to the fact that he slipped on the green grass. The bully was up in a moment, however, and he knew better than to try conclusions with Tom again. Instead, he stood out of reach and sputtered, you just wait, Tom Swift. You just wait. Well, I'm waiting, responded the other calmly. I'll get even with you, went on Andy. You think you're smart because you got ahead of me, but I'll get square. Look here, burst out the young inventor determinedly, taking a step towards his antagonist, at which Andy quickly retreated. I don't want any more of that talk from you, Andy Foger. That's twice you've made threats against me today. You put that log across the road, and if you try anything like that for your second attempt, I'll make you wish you hadn't. That applies to you too, Sam, he added, glancing at the other lad. I ain't gonna do nothing, declared Sam. I told Andy not to put that tree. Keep still, can't ya? shouted the bully. Come on. We'll get even with him, that's all, he muttered as he went back into the bushes where the auto was. And he cranked up, and he and his crony, getting into the car, were about to start off. Hold on, cried Tom. You'll take that log from across the road, or I'll have you arrested for obstructing traffic, and that's a serious offense. I'm gonna take it away, growled Andy. Give a fella a show, can't you? He cast an ugly look at Tom, but the latter only smiled. It was no easy task for Sam and Andy to pull the log out of the way, as they could hardly lift it to slip the rope under. But they finally managed it, and by the power of the car, hauled it to one side. Then they speed off. It's weird, I wonder why that didn't say sped off. Oh well. I say, those guys are as mean and contrary as my mule Boomerang is sometimes, observed Eradicate. Only Boomerang ain't quite so mean as that. I should hope not, Rad, observed Tom. I'm ever so much obliged for your warning. I guess I'll be getting home now. Come around next week. Indeed I will, replied Eradicate. I'll come around and eradicate all the dirt in your place, Mr. Swift. Yep. Eradicate's my name, and that's my profession. Eradicating dirt. Much obliged. I'll call around. Giddy up, Boomerang. The mule lazily flicked his ears, but did not stir. And Tom, knowing the process of arousing the animal, would take some time. Oh, <laughs> and Tom, knowing the process of arousing the animal that would take some time, uh, hurried up the hill to where he had left his motorcycle. Eradicate was still engaged on the task of trying to arouse his steed to a sense of its duty when the young inventor flashed by on his way home. So, now you own a broken motorboat, observed Mr. Swift when Tom had related the circumstances of the auction. Well, now you have it. What are you going to do with it? Fix it, first of all, replied the son. It needs considerable tinkering up, but nothing what, what I can do if you... But nothing but what I can do if you'll help me. That's so weird. 
Of course I will. Do you think you can get any speed out of it? Well, I'm not so anxious for speed. I want a good, comfortable boat, and the arrow will be that. I've named it, you see. I'm going back to Lanton this afternoon, take some tools along, and repair it so I can run the boat over to here. Then I'll get at it and fix it up. I've got a plan for you, Dad. What is it? asked the inventor, rather his rather tired face lighting up with interest. I'm going to take you on a vacation trip. A vacation trip? Yeah, you need a rest. You've been working too hard over that gyroscope invention. Yes, Tom, I think I have, admitted Mr. Swift. But I am very much interested in it, and I think I can get it to work. If I do it, if I do, it will make a great difference in the control of airplanes. It will make them certainly more stable and able to fly in almost any wind. But I have my but I puzzled my brains over some features of it. However, I don't quite see what you mean. You need a rest, Dad, said Mr. Swift's son kindly. I want you to forget all about patents, invention, machinery, and even the gyroscope for a week or two. When I get my motorboat in shape, I'm going to take you and Ned Newton up the lake for a cruise. We can camp out, or if we had to, we could sleep in the boat. I'm going to put a canopy on it and arrange some bunks. It'll do you good, and perhaps new ideas for your gyroscope may come to you after a rest. Perhaps they will, Tom. I certainly am tired enough to need a vacation. It's very kind of you to think of me in connection with your boat, but if you're going to get it this afternoon, you better start if you expect to get back by night. I think Mrs. Baggert has dinner ready. After the meal, Tom selected a number of tools from his own particular machine shop and carried them down to the dock on the lake, where his two small boats were tied. "'Aren't you going back on your motorcycle?' asked his father. "'No, Dad. I'm going to row over to Lanton, and if I can get the arrow fixed, I'll tow my robo back, rowboat back.' <laughs> "'Very well. Then you won't be in any danger from Andy Foger. I must speak to his father about him.' No, Dad, don't, exclaimed the young inventor quickly. I can fight my own battles with Andy. I don't fancy he will bother me again right away. Tom found it more of a task than he had anticipated to get the motor in shape to run the arrow back under, back under her own power. The magneto was out of order and the batteries needed renewing, while the spark coil had short-circuited and took considerable time to adjust. But by using some new dry cells which Mr. Hastings gave him, and cutting out the magneto, or small dynamo, which produces the spark that exploded the gasoline in the cylinders, Tom soon had a fine, fat, hot spark from the auxiliary ignition system. Then, adjusting the timer and throttle on the engine, and seeing that the gasoline tank was filled, the lad started up his motor. Mr. Hastings helped him, but after a few turns of the flywheel, there were no explosions. Finally, after the carburetor, which is the device where the gasoline is mixed with air to produce an explosive mixture, had been adjusted, the motor started off as if, as if it had intended to do so all the while and was only taking its time to do it. The machine doesn't run as smooth as it oughta, commented Mr. Hastings. No, it needs a thorough overhauling, agreed the owner of the arrow. I'll get at it tomorrow. And with that, he swung out into the lake, towing his rowboat after him. A motorboat of my own, exulted Tom, as he twirled the steering wheel and noted how readily the craft answered her helm. This is great. He steered down the lake and then, turning around, went up at a mile or more before heading for his own dock, as he wanted to see how the engine behaved. With some changes and adjustments, I can make this a speedy boat, thought Tom. I'll get right at it. I shouldn't wonder if I could make a good showing against Mr. Hastings' new Carlopa, though his boat's got four cylinders and mine's got two. The lad was proceeding leisurely along the lake shore near his home with the motor throttled down to test it at low speed when he heard someone shout. Looking towards the bank... Tom saw a man waving his hands. I wonder what he wants, thought our hero as he put the wheel over to send his craft to shore. He heard a moment later for the man on the bank cried, I say, my young friend, 
Do you know anything about automobiles? Of course you do, or you wouldn't be running a motorboat. Bless my very existence, but I'm in trouble. My machine has stopped on a lonely road, and I can't seem to get it started. I happen to hear your boat, and I came here to hail you. Bless my coat pockets, but I am in trouble. Can you help me? Bless my soul and gizzard. Okay. So, because I didn't read ahead, uh, I didn't know who this was until this next next line. Um, but clearly, th clearly, this is Mr. Damon. Mr. Damon, exclaimed Tom, shutting off the power, for he was now near shore. Of course I'll help you, Mr. Damon. For the young inventor had recognized the eccentric man of whom he had purchased the motorcycle and who had helped him in rounding up the thieves. Well, bless my shoelaces, if it isn't Tom Swift, exclaimed Mr. Damon, who seemed very fond of calling down blessings upon himself or upon articles of his own dress or person. Yes, I'm here, admitted Tom with a laugh. And in a motorboat, too. Bless my pocketbook, but you did run but did that run away with someone who sold it to you cheap? No, not exactly, and the lad explained how he had come to, into possession of it. By this time, he was ashore and had tied the arrow to an overhanging tree. Then Tom proceeded to where Mr. Damon had left his stalled automobile. The eccentric man was wealthy, and his physician had instructed him to ride about in the car for his health. Tom soon located the trouble. The carburetor had become clogged, and it was soon in working order again. Well, now that you've got that boat, I don't suppose you'd be riding around the country so much, commented Mr. Damon as he got into his car. Bless my spark plug, but if you ever get over to Waterfield where I live, come and see me. It's handy to get there. Get, get, it's handy. Whoa, I can't speak. It's handy to get there by water. I'll come someday, promised the lad. Bless my hat band, but I hope so, went on the eccentric individual as he prepared to start his car. Tom completed the remainder of the trip to his house without incident, and his father came down to the dock to see the motorboat. He agreed with his son that it was a bargain and that it could easily be put in fine shape. The youth spent all the next day and part of the following working on the craft. He overhauled the ignition system, which was the jump spark style, cleaned the magneto, and adjusted the gasoline and compression taps so that they fit better. Then he readjusted the rudder lines, tightening them on the steering wheel, and looked over the piping from the gasoline tank. The tank was in the forward compartment, and upon inspecting this, the lad concluded to change the plan by which the big galvanized iron box was held in place. He took out the old wooden braces and set them closer together, putting in a few new ones. The tank won't vibrate so when I'm going at full screen, uh, st uh, full speed. Wow, this is just a mumble patch of a storytelling night. <laughs> okay, the tank will not vibrate so while I, when I'm going at full speed. He explained to his father. Is that where the strange man was tampering with the lock the day of the auction? Asked Mr. Swift. Yes, but I don't see what he could want in this compartment. Do you, Dad? The inventor got into the boat and looked carefully into the rather dark space where the tank, where the tank fitted. He went over every inch of it and pointing to one of the thick wooden blocks that supported the tank, he asked, Did you bore that hole in there, Tom? No, it was there before I touched the braces, but it isn't a hole, or rather, someone bored it and stopped it up again. It doesn't weaken the brace any. No, I suppose not. I was just wondering whether that was one of the new blocks or an old one. Oh, an old one. I'm going to paint them too, so in case the water leaks in or the gasoline leaks out, the wood won't be affected. A gasoline tank should vibrate as little as possible if you don't want it to leak. I guess I'll paint the whole interior of this compartment white. Then I can see a way into the far corners of it. I think that's a good idea, commented Mr. Swift. It was four days after his purchase of the boat before Tom was ready to make a long trip in it. Up to that time, he had gone on short spins not far from the dock in order to test the engine, the engine adjustment. 
The lad found it was working very well, but he decided with a new kind of spark plugs for the two cylinders that he could get more speed out of it. Finally, the forward compartment was painted and a general overhauling given the hull, and Tom was ready to put his boat to a good test. Come on, Ned, he said to his chum early one evening after Mr. Swift said he was too tired to go out on a trial run. We'll see what the arrow will do now. From the time Tom started up the motor, it was evident that the boat was going through the water at a rapid rate. For a mile or two, for a mile or more, the two lads speeded along, enjoying it hugely. Then Ned exclaimed, Something's coming at us. He turned his head and looked. Then he called out, It's Mr. Hastings and his new Carlopa. I wonder if he wants a race. Guess he'd have it all his own way, suggested Ned. Oh, I don't know. I can get a little more speed out of my boat. Tom waited until the former owner of the Arrow was up to him. Want a race? asked Mr. Hastings good-naturedly. Sure, agreed Tom, and he shoved the timer ahead to produce quicker explosions. The Arrow seemed to leap forward and for a moment was ahead of the Carlopa, but with a motion of his hand to the spark lever, Mr. Hastings also increased his speed. For a moment, the two boats were on even terms, then the larger and newer one forged ahead. Tom had expected it, but he was a little disappointed. That's doing first rate, complimented Mr. Hastings as he passed them. Better than I was ever able to make her do when, even when she was new, Tom. This made the present owner of the Arrow feel somewhat consoled. He and Ned ran on for a few miles, the Carlopa in the meanwhile disappearing from view around a bend. Then Tom and his chum turned around and made for the swift dock. She certainly is a dandy, declared Ned. I wish I had one like it. Oh, I intend that you shall have plenty of rides in this, went on his friend. When you get your vacation, you dad and I are going on a tour. And he explained his plan, with, uh, which, it is needless to say, met with Ned's hearty approval. Just before going to bed, some hours later, Tom decided to go down to the dock to make sure he had shut off the gasoline leading from the tank of his boat to the motor. It was a calm early summer night with a new moon giving a little light and the lad went down to the lake in his slippers. As he neared the boathouse, he heard a noise. Water rat, he murmured, or maybe muskrats. I must set some traps. <clears throat> As Tom entered the boathouse, he started back in, the, in alarm for a bright light flashed up almost in his eyes. Who's here? he cried, and at that moment someone sprang out of his motorboat, scrambling into a rowing craft, which the youth could dimly make out in front of the dock, and began to pull away. Hold on there, cried the young inventor. Who are you? What do you want? Come back here. The person in the coat returned no answer. With his heart doing beats over time, Tom lighted a lantern and made a hasty examination of the arrow. It did not appear to have been harmed but a glance showed that the door of the gasoline compartment had been unlocked and was open. Tom jumped down into his craft. Someone's been at that compartment again, he murmured. I wonder if it was the same man who acted so suspiciously at the auction. What could his object be anyhow? The next moment, he uttered an exclamation of startled surprise and picked up something from the bottom of the boat. It was a bunch of keys with a tag attached bearing the owner's name. Andy Foger, murmured Tom. So this is how he was trying to get even. Maybe he started to put a hole in the tank or in my boat. End of chapter 5. Alright, back to the chat room. Okay. Like we got a few more people in. So, uh, Snorks, did you did your uh, job change or something, or or what what uh, what is the situation that allows you to hear it today?
Oh. Uh, sometimes you're working at a place that you can't use a computer. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're going to do at least one more chapter. That chapter was a lot longer than the one prior, so we probably will not do a fourth chapter. All right. And sometimes you're working at times where I, I'm not having a story time. That's true. Although you can always watch the video on demand if you will, if you like. Okay. Back to the story. Previously on... on <laughs> previously on Tom Swift and his motorboat. In Chapter 5... Uh, Basically, Tom got the boat home, started working on it, was out on the lake, and got home and found some evidence that Andy Foger was messing with the boat. Chapter 6. Towing Some Girls With a sense of anger mingled with an apprehension lest some harm should have been done to his craft, the owner of the arrow went carefully over it. He could find nothing wrong. The engine was all right, and all that appeared to have been accomplished by the unbidden visitor was the opening of the locked forward compartment. That this had been done by one of many keys on Andy Foger's ring was evident. Now what could have been his object? mused Tom. I should think that if he wanted to put a hole in the boat, he would have done it amidship, where the water would have a better chance to come in. Or perhaps he wanted to flood it with gasoline, and... The idea of fire was in Tom's mind, and he did not finish his half-completed thought. That may have been it, he resumed after a hasty examination of the gas tank, to make sure there were no leaks in it. To get even with me for outbidding him on the boat, Andy may have wanted to destroy the arrow. Well, of all the mean tricks, that's about the limit. But wait until I see him. I've got evidence against him. I, and Tom looked at the key ring. I could almost have him arrested for this. Going outside the boathouse, Tom stood on the edge of the dock and peered into the darkness. He could hear the faint sound of someone rowing across the lake, but there was no light. He had one of those electric flash lanterns decided Tom. If I hadn't found his keys, I might have thought it was Happy Harry instead of Andy. Now what's funny is I will bet you when he's talking about those electric flash lanterns, it's kind of like an early flashlight. Remember, this is like 1910. The young inventor went back into the house after carefully locking the boat compartment and detaching from the engine an electrical device, without which the motor in the arrow could not be started. That'll prevent them from running away with my boat anyhow, decided Tom, and I'll tell Garrett Jackson to keep a sharp watch tonight. Jackson was the engineer at Mr. Swift's workshop. Tom told his father of the happening, and Mr. Swift was properly indignant. He wanted to go at once to see Mr. Foger and complain of Andy's act, but Tom counseled waiting. I'll attend to Andy myself, said the young inventor. He's getting desperate, I guess, or he wouldn't try to set the place on fire. But wait until I show him these keys. Bright and early the next morning, the owner of the motorboat was down to the dock inspecting it. The engineer, who had been on watch part of the night, reported that there had been no disturbance, and Tom found everything all right. I wonder if I'd better go over and accuse Andy now, or wait until I see him and spring this evidence on him, thought our hero. Then he decided it would be better to wait. He took the arrow out after breakfast, his father going on a short spin with him. But I must go back now and work on my gyroscope invention, said Mr. Swift, when about two hours had been spent on the lake. I'm making good progress with it. You need a vacation, decided Tom. I'll be ready to take you and Ned in about two weeks. He'll have two weeks off then, and we'll have some glorious times together. 
That afternoon, Tom put some new style spark plugs in the cylinders of his motor and found that he had considerably increased the revolutions of the engine, due to a better explosion being obtained. He also made some minor adjustments and the next day he went out alone for a long run. Heading up the lake, Tom was soon in sight of a popular excursion resort that was frequently visited by church and Sunday school organizations in the vicinity of Shopton. The lad saw a number of rowing craft and a small motorboat circling around the opposite resort and remarked, There must be a picnic at the Grove today. Guess I'll run up and take a look. The lad was soon in the midst of quite a flotilla of rowboats, most of them manned by pretty girls or in charge of boys who were giving sisters, their own or some other chaps, a trip on the water. Tom throttled his boat down to slow speed and looked with pleasure on the pretty scene. His boat attracted considerable attention, for motorcraft were not numerous on Lake Carlopa. As our hero passed a boat, containing three very pretty young ladies, Tom heard one of them exclaim, There he is now! That's Tom Swift! Something in the tones of the voice attracted his attention. He turned and saw a brown-eyed girl smiling at him. She bowed and asked, blushing the while, well, have you caught any more runaway horses lately? Runaway horses? Why, what? Oh, it's Miss Nestor, exclaiming the lad, recognizing the young lady whose steed he had frightened one day when he was on his bicycle. As told in the first volume of this series, the horse had run away, being alarmed at the flashing of Tom's wheel, and, Mar and Miss Mary Nestor of Mansburg was in grave danger. So... You've given up the bicycle for the motorboat? went on the young lady. Yes, replied Tom with a smile, shutting off the power. And I haven't had a chance to save any girls since I've had it. The two boats had drifted close together, and Miss Nestor introduced her two companions to Tom. Don't you want to come in and take a ride? Is it safe? asked Jenny Haddon, one of the trio. Of course it is, Jenny, or he wouldn't be out in it said Miss Nestor hastily. Come on, let's get in. I'm just dying for a motorboat ride. What will we do with our boat? asked Katie Carson. Oh, I can tow that. Get right in and I'll take you all around the lake, replied the youth. Not too far, stipulated the girl who had figured in the runway. We must be back for lunch, which will be served in about an hour. Our church and Sunday school are having a picnic. Maybe Mr. Swift will come and have some lunch with us, suggested Miss Carson, blushing prettily. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, answered Tom, and then he laughed at his formal reply, the girls joining in. We'd be glad to have you. Oh, the boat's tipping over, she suddenly screamed. Oh, no, Tom hastened to assure her, coming to the side to help her in. It just tilts a bit. With the weight of so many on one side, it couldn't capsize if it tried. In another moment, the three were in a roomy cockpit, and Tom had made the empty rowboat fast to the stern. He was about to start up when, from another boat containing two little girls and two slightly larger boys, came a plaintive cry. Oh, mister, give us a ride. Sure, agreed Tom pleasantly. Just fasten your boat to the other rowboat, and I'll tow you. One of the boys did this, and then with three pretty girls as his companions in the arrow and towing the two boats, Tom started off. The girls were very much interested in the craft and asked all sorts of questions about how the engine operated. Tom explained as clearly as he could how the gasoline exploded in the cylinders, about the electric spark, and about the propeller. Then, when he had finished, Miss Haddon remarked naively, Oh, Mr. Swift, you've explained it beautifully, and I'm sure if our teacher in school made things as clear as you have, that I could get along fine. I understand all about it, except I don't see what makes the engines go. Oh, Tom said faintly, and he wondered what would be the best remark to make under the circumstances, when Miss Nestor created a diversion by looking at her watch and exclaiming, Oh, girls, it's lunchtime. We must go ashore. Will you kindly put about, Mr. Swift? I hope that's the proper term. And land us? Is that right? And she looked archly at Tom. <laughs> That's perfectly right, he admitted with a laugh and a glance into the girl's brown eyes. I'll put you ashore at once. 
and he headed for the small dock. And come yourself to take lunch with us, added Miss Haddon. I'm afraid I might be in the way, stammered Tom. I, I have a pretty good appetite, and... I suppose you think that girls on a picnic don't take much lunch, finished Miss Nestor. But I assure you, we have plenty, and that you will be very welcome, she added warmly. Yes, and I'd like to have him explain over again how the engine works, went on Miss Adden. I am so interested. Tom helped the girls out, receiving their thanks as well as those of the children in the second boat. But as he walked with the young ladies through the grove, the young inventor registered a mental vow that he would steer clear of explaining again how a gasoline engine worked. Now, come right over this way to our table, invited Miss Nestor. I want you to meet Papa and Mama. Tom followed her, and he stepped from behind a clump of trees he saw, standing not far away, a figure that seemed strangely familiar. A moment later, the figure turned, and Tom saw Andy Foger confronting him. At the sight of our hero, the bully turned red and walked away quickly, while Tom's fingers touched the ring of the keys in his pocket. End of Chapter 6 Okay, so, uh, looks like we are going to stop for that. And we'll go back to the chat room here. So yeah, uh, we're figuring um, three chapters each night. Uh, there's about 25 chapters in the book. So after eight nights, uh, which is, uh, yeah, after eight nights, we'll have finished the, the book. Uh, the audio podcast gets put out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and contains one chapter each night. Uh, if you want to follow the audio podcast, you can go to anchor.fm slash storytime with Kurt. Otherwise, you can follow me at VO by Kurt on Twitter or simply join us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Kurtstable. Oh, thank you, Nicole, for putting that there. Uh, I want to thank you guys for, for joining me in the chat room. And we will see you again Tuesday evening. And we are, as, as in the calendar or the, the countdown calendar below, um, Sunday evenings at 6, Tuesday evenings at 7, and Thursday evenings at 7 for story time with Kurt. With that, I bid you... Uh, Fond adieu, and we'll see you next time. Have a great week.